I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Welcome to this podcast of The People's Pharmacy. You can find previous podcasts and more information on a range of health topics at peoplespharmacy.com. Have you ever had the feeling of sand in your eyes? It can be incredibly uncomfortable. Dry eyes can be like that. This is The People's Pharmacy with Terry and Joe Graydon. When tears don't work as they should to keep the surface of the eye moist and lubricated, the result is something ophthalmologists call keratoconjunctivitis sicca. The rest of us call this condition dry eye syndrome. Some medications can actually cause dry eyes. So can certain procedures such as cataract surgery or LASIK. What can be done to ease the discomfort of dry eyes? Which eye drops are best and which should you avoid? Coming up on The People's Pharmacy, Coping with Dry Eyes. In The People's Pharmacy Health Headlines, scientists are discovering new symptoms associated with long COVID. Epidemiologists estimate that between 10 and 30 percent of people who experience a SARS-CoV-2 infection suffer with persistent problems, including impairment of the sense of smell, fatigue, shortness of breath, and muscle or joint pain. Researchers in the U.K. analyzed data from people at least 12 weeks after a COVID infection that did not require hospitalization. Nearly 500,000 people were included and matched to individuals who had not been infected. They reported a surprising range of 62 symptoms that were much more common among those who had been infected. The most common were problems with the sense of smell, hair loss, sneezing, trouble ejaculating, reduced sex drive, shortness of breath without exertion, and fatigue. This is the first study to identify hair loss and sexual dysfunction as common post-COVID difficulties. Mental health and cognitive problems were also common, including anxiety, depression, insomnia, and brain fog. Do you get drowsy after lunch? Now that so many people are working from home, the temptation to take an afternoon nap may sometimes be overwhelming. A new study in the journal Hypertension suggests that such a practice may be harmful to your health. The investigators used data from the U.K. Biobank. Of the more than 500,000 subjects in the database, over 300,000 answered a questionnaire about their napping behavior. The researchers found consistent evidence linking daytime naps with hypertension. They noted a surge in evening blood pressure following daytime napping. Volunteers under the age of 60 had a 20% higher risk of being diagnosed with hypertension in contrast to those who rarely, if ever, napped. There was also an increased risk of stroke in the nappers. One possible explanation might be that people who do not get a good night's sleep may be more prone to nap, and that could be a contributing factor. A new analysis of data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey shows that more American youth are becoming obese. Scientists collected data in 2011 to 2012, 2013 to 2014, 2015 to 2016, and 2017 until early 2020 when the pandemic set in. They measured the height and weight of children from 2 to 19 years of age and calculated their body mass index. Nearly 15,000 youngsters participated in the survey. Between 2011 and 2020, obesity rates went from 18% to 21% among boys and from 17% to 22% among girls. Both the youngest age group of children 2 to 5 years old and the oldest, with teens 12 to 19 years old, saw significant increases in obesity. Childhood obesity has been associated with metabolic risks throughout life. Accordingly, the researchers call for research into effective prevention. Most people assume that if the FDA issues a warning letter about unapproved ingredients in dietary supplements, the manufacturers will recall the products or make appropriate changes. That doesn't always happen, though. Researchers reviewed 31 products that were the subject of FDA warning letters. 
The supplements contain stimulants similar to amphetamine, ephedrine, or other compounds that pose serious health risks. Warning letters were issued in 2015, 16, and 19. In January 2022, the investigators searched online for the products that had received FDA warning letters. Of the 31, one had been withdrawn from the marketplace. At least nine were still being sold online. Four of these listed one of the prohibited ingredients on the label. It turns out that FDA's actions to ensure that manufacturers are compliant may not always work as expected. For decades, neuroscientists have focused on the buildup of amyloid beta plaques in the brain as the primary cause of Alzheimer's disease. Now, questions have been raised about whether the initial research that sent scientists in this direction could have been misleading. During this time, billions of dollars have been spent in research and drug development, but much of that money and effort might have been wasted. That's the health news from the People's Pharmacy this week. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy. I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. Today, we're talking about a topic that may not seem that weighty. It's certainly not life-threatening, but it can be life-altering. Doctors call it keratoconjunctivitis sicca. Ordinary people call it dry eyes. A surprising number of American adults experience this uncomfortable condition every day. Imagine sand in your eyes that won't go away. What can be done for relief? To find out, we turn to Dr. Priya Gupta. She is Managing Director of Triangle Eye Consultants in Raleigh, North Carolina. Dr. Gupta specializes in cataract, cornea, and refractive surgery and is an international expert in the area of dry eye disease. She's an adjunct associate professor of ophthalmology at Tulane University School of Medicine and previously served on the faculty at Duke University Eye Center in Durham, North Carolina, as an associate professor of ophthalmology. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy, Dr. Priya Gupta. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. It really is a pleasure. It's such an important topic. Indeed it is. And Dr. Gupta, I have to be honest with you. It seems astonishing how many people are suffering from this thing that we refer to as dry eye. I mean, I've seen numbers as many as 16 million people, and that may not count for everybody. So maybe we can just start with something very basic, like what do we mean by dry eyes? Well, you, you've hit it right on the head, which is that this is a very common disease. Um, and we're only really getting better at diagnosing it um, as uh, eye care providers. And, you know, when we think about what is dry eye, well, you know, most people think, well, I don't have enough tears. My eyes are dry. But it's a much more complicated condition than that. There are so many contributors to dry eye. But simply put, you know, there's an imbalance of the tear film. And that really refers to not only the water component of tears, but also the oil layer, and then the chemistry of all the proteins and molecules within the tear itself. How would someone know if they had dry eyes? What are the symptoms? The most classic symptoms of dry eye disease are irritated, red eyes, uh, People might describe feeling like they have something in their eyes. Uh, Some of the more important symptoms that patients might not actually associate with dry eye disease can actually be things like fluctuating vision. Um, You know, we live in a very digital society. I have lots of patients come in and say, you know, I I think I need glasses. I'm, I'm not seeing as well on the computer. And it really is that fluctuation of vision, um, which is a hallmark of an unstable tear film. You use the word disease, dry eye disease. And I think a lot of people go, whoa, whoa, it's it's not like that big a deal. But for some people, it really is that big a deal. Can you describe what it feels like? Because we've met people who say it has changed my life for the worse. I'm in terrible shape because my eyes always hurt. And I'd also like you to follow up with that idea of the computer, because we've heard that when people are staring at a computer screen for not just minutes, but hours, 
that sometimes they don't blink enough. And I wonder if that has something to do with it, our modern lifestyle. Absolutely. Well, you know, dry eye, you know, you think, I I love how you said the word, you know, disease with surprise, because a lot of patients, um, a lot of, you know, just society thinks of, oh, it's, you know, it's dry eyes, you go to the store, you buy a tear, you fix it. But really, for patients that have dry eye disease, this can be a life changing disease. They don't feel confident in their vision. Some patients report losing productivity at work, Um, they have to take frequent breaks to use eye drops. They may even have to actually have um, prescription medication and, and, and more advanced treatments to treat their disease. But it really is something that makes patients feel isolated and, and alone in some ways because, you know, it is something that society doesn't understand greatly. And what about the computer business? Yeah. So, you know, a pandemic hits. And if if I thought we were already a digital society, I think we became even more of a digital society um, since the pandemic. But really, the tear film is made of three structures, the water layer, a mucus layer, and then an oil layer. And in some patients with dry eye disease, actually the vast majority, that oil layer is responsible for protecting the surface of the eye. And so when we're staring at computer screens, you know, we're really intensely focused. We're not, um, you know, we're not thinking about some of our uh, basics here, but what happens to our blink reflex is that it actually reduces. So we're trying to focus, we're trying to see, you know, be on our Zooms (laughs) and um, we don't, by not blinking as much, less of that oil Uh, goes into the tear film and the tear film evaporates too quickly. So patients may actually worsen their dry eye disease with um, excessive computer uh, and, you know, reading type work. You mentioned fluctuating vision and it occurs to me that um, perhaps other people have had a similar experience to my experience, which is when I first get out of bed in the morning, I can't focus very well to read. It, you know, it, it takes uh, half an hour or so. Now, I don't usually need to read within the first half hour of getting out of bed. So that's not a problem. But is that what you're talking about? Yeah, it, it, it absolutely could be. Some people um, develop some dryness overnight. Um, if your eyelids don't completely close, you know, in uh, warmer areas where there's air conditioning and fans on at night, that can dry you out. But really on the computer, if you imagine, you know, you're staring at a word uh, or a, a paragraph of text, for some patients with dry eye disease, it literally might be that the paragraph is in focus and then seconds later come out of focus and then go back into focus. And, you know, they might blink several times to try to clear their vision, but it can be a very frustrating process to not have um, the confidence to rely upon that consistent vision. I've heard people complain of a grittiness, like almost as if they have something in their eyes that like, like sand has gotten into their eye. Is that a common symptom for, for some people? Absolutely. Um, Irritation inside the eyes is one of the most common symptoms of dry eye disease. Um, And it can be very frustrating. You know, patients sometimes come to clinic saying, no, I think there's something in there. (laughs) And so what happens, the reason why patients feel that uh, sandy or irritated uh, uh, feeling on the surface of the eye is that over time, as the the dry eye disease um, becomes more significant, inflammation related to the dry eye actually causes some breakdown of the corneal epithelial cells. So I like to describe it as these little dry pits, you know, and if if the surface is not smooth, you're going to feel those bumps or pits on the surface. Um, And that is a result of the inflammatory process of dry eye disease. Can we talk about the causes? We have talked about not blinking often enough when you're looking at your screen, but presumably that's only one of many causes for dry eyes. Absolutely. Um, Dry eye is really a multifactorial disease. Um, There's many risk factors. Um, Certainly dry eye disease is more common as we age. Um, And for women in particular, as we get older and go through menopause, the change in hormonal balance and hormonal balance, um, you know, does apply to men as well um, as we age. And so, you know, I would say age being postmenopausal, dry eye is more common in women in general, Um, but there's a whole host of other things. Um, So diseases such as thyroid disease, autoimmune disease, 
um, can really uh, wreak havoc with the system and dysregulate to your production. Um, and then, of course, certain medications, certain blood pressure medications, anxiety and depression medications are two common classes of medicines that can lead to dry eye disease. And then last, but certainly not least, as eye doctors, you know, as we treat other conditions um, or as patients have ocular surgery, that can also lead to dry eye. I'd like to get to the, um, the surgical issue in a moment. But first, because you mentioned pharmaceuticals, drugs, that's my area of expertise, <laughs> anticholinergic medications, these are drugs that a lot of health professionals don't always recognize because it, it's not just motion sickness medicine like scopolamine or antihistamines like Benadryl. There are scores of drugs that have what we call anticholinergic activity that a lot of people don't even imagine. So can you give us a little indicator of what would be some of the medications that people might need to reconsider if they're experiencing dry eyes? Absolutely. Well, you know, the class of anticholinergics um, can have a, a direct limitation on um, tear production. And so that's kind of the, the direct mechanism there. But truly, I mean, so yes, you're absolutely right. You know, the, the Benadryls of the world, but things that, you know, certain medications in that uh, tryptoline family are used for restless legs, um, uh, sleep at night, um, I also ask patients to look at their list for um, blood pressure medications. Um, interestingly enough, some of those medications can have direct effect on tear production. And, you know, of course, as clinicians, we're not going to ask our patients to not be on blood pressure medication. That can be a life-saving medication. But that um, is something that, you know, just when you're looking at patients holistically, you know, they can have several reasons. Could you give um, us a couple of examples, Dr. Gupta? Oh, sure. Um, hydrochlorothiazide medications. That's um, what I was thinking. And you know, yeah. hydrochlorothiazide is in very just common about all the Everything. blood pressure pills. So it's a yeah. diuretic and people should ask their doctor, well, could I, could I move to some other form of blood pressure medicine? We just have a few seconds before our break, but I did want to ask you about surgery, LASIK surgery, cataract surgery, I've heard people say, you know, I was fine until I had my cataracts done, and now all of a sudden I am suffering from dry eye. Well, you know, the process of intraocular surgery or even LASIK surgery does cause some disruption to the corneal nerves. Um, in many patients, that disruption can be enough to tip them over from being uh, asymptomatic with their dry eye disease to symptomatic. And so that's really the key mechanism there. You are listening to Dr. Priya Gupta, an expert in dry eye, cataracts, and cornea surgery. She's an adjunct associate professor of ophthalmology at Tulane University School of Medicine and is a recipient of the American Academy of Ophthalmology Achievement Award. After the break, we'll find out how doctors diagnose dry eyes. How do they treat the condition? If you need artificial tears, how do you choose the best ones? The meibomium glands help keep the surface of the eye lubricated. How do they work? We'll also hear about the LipoFlow technology designed to get these glands working well again. You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. This podcast is made possible in part by Cocovia, maker of high-potency cocoflavanol supplements. Cocoflavanols are among the most well-studied plant-based nutrients, backed by 20 years of scientific research. Cocovia Cardio Health is available in capsules or powder, providing 500 milligrams of cocoflavanols daily. This supports better blood flow and vascular performance. Cocovia also offers Memory Plus, a supplement with 750 milligrams of cocoflavanols. This product is backed by four different clinical studies, demonstrating significant improvement in several aspects of memory. Cocovia flavanols offer you all the benefits of chocolate without the sugar. Get 15% off your order by using the discount code PEOPLES15. That discount code People's 15. More information at cocovia.com. Welcome. 
Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Cocovia, maker of high-potency cocoflavanol supplements that support cognitive and cardiovascular health. More information at cocovia.com. And by Gaia Herbs, providing transparency through its Meet Your Herbs platform, tracing the origin and DNA of each product. More information at Gaia, that's G-A-I-A herbs, dot com. Today, we're learning about dry eyes. This condition may not seem all that serious, but it affects millions of people and can make their lives miserable. Artificial tears are often the cornerstone for treating dry eyes. You can find such products without a prescription in pharmacies and supermarkets. For years, many contained preservatives that might actually aggravate the very condition they were meant to relieve. Our guest is Dr. Priya Gupta, Managing Director of Triangle Eye Consultants. She's an adjunct associate professor of ophthalmology at Tulane University School of Medicine and was previously an associate professor at Duke University Eye Center. She specializes in cataract, cornea, and refractive surgery and is an international expert in the area of dry eye disease. Dr. Gupta, I wonder if you can tell us how a doctor diagnoses dry eyes. What's the process? Well, traditionally, we actually have been, have had a very hard time diagnosing dry eye. I think traditionally from years past, you know, we waited until patients uh, came to us with symptoms. And now a lot of practices are being proactive by giving patients questionnaires. Questionnaires are great. Um, Patients always have downtime in a doctor's office, and it really helps to identify uh, symptoms in different environments. Uh, For example, do you have trouble with your eyes when you're outside and it's windy or when you're using a computer? Uh, Those are screening tools. And then in the office, so if you're seeing your eye care provider, there are certain diagnostic tests that can assess your tear film chemistry, as well as the inflammation on the surface. Now, I've been tested with like, they poked a little piece of paper into my eye. And I'm I'm curious about, I mean, don't we have more sophisticated technologies than, than what, I, what I was tested with? Absolutely. The test you're describing is the Shermer's test. It was invented in 1903. <laughs> and most clinicians... <laughs> latest technology. I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> the, the most clinicians today don't do that test. And mostly because it's it, it measures your baseline tear production. And, and while that can be helpful, it doesn't really change uh, how we treat patients clinically. And as you uh, astutely mentioned, it's not the most comfortable test, but absolutely the modern tear film tests such as osmolarity and measuring markers of inflammation have really helped us come a long way to especially identify disease earlier in the process. And then also, you know, simple things that we as clinicians can't ignore is to actually pay attention when we're looking at the surface of the eye to look for what's called conjunctival or corneal staining. Uh, We put a little bit of fluorescein dye in the surface of the eye, and that is a very uh, accurate and easy way to identify breakdown of the surface that can be caused by dry eye. Now, of course, what people really want to know is okay, there's this gritty feeling or, yeah, I do stare at a computer screen five, six, eight, ten hours a day. And after a while, my eyes get very irritated and inflamed. And I don't always stand up and look out the window and blink. So how do I treat it? What do I do? It's really affecting the quality of my life. Absolutely. There's so many different ways to be treated for dry eye. I think a lot of patients self-treat initially by going to the drugstore and getting artificial tears. I would encourage all patients out there to actually go to your eye care provider. There are a lot of newer therapies for dry eye disease. One, you know, one test we didn't talk about um, that really relates to a treatment here is meibomian gland imaging. We call it mybography. Um, And we talked about the meibomian glands being a really critical structure for producing oil in the tear film. And this infrared image lets us know if the glands are atrophied or not functioning properly. And so some of the modern treatments for dry eye disease are really focused on treating those meibomian glands. 
Other treatments are focused more on treating the inflammation related to dry eye. This would be eye drops, so topical eye drops um, to treat inflammation. Most of them are in the uh, you know category that help to improve uh, T cell uh, process. And then you know more recently, we actually have um, a new nasal spray that helps to increase tear production, which is kind of interesting um, from a drop, well, I, I treating wanna, dry eye perspective. I want to go back for a moment to the very first thing you mentioned. Going to the pharmacy, or you can now find the um, artificial tears in a lot of different places, not just in pharmacies, and, and buying something, which is what I think a lot of people do, thinking, ah, that's the solution. I remember interviewing an ophthalmologist, Dr. Jeffrey Gilbard, decades ago, and he said, well, not all artificial tears are created equal, and you really should avoid those that have preservatives in them. That may do more harm than good. So are there still artificial tears on the market with preservatives, A? B, if you do go to the pharmacy to buy artificial tears, there are lots. How do you make the right choice? There are some that come in individual containers so that you use one, you know, at at the time that you put the artificial tears in, and there are others that come in bottles. There are some that come with decongestants in them to take the red out. Help us make decisions about what we buy over the counter. So, you know, that, that is such an important message about preservatives. And, you know, I love that that was brought to light so many, uh, you know, years ago, but yes, there are still tiers with preservatives that patients can purchase over the counter. And so my strong preference is for patients to use preservative free tiers. And you asked about the packaging. I think one of the things that patients sort of, you know, besides maybe not knowing that preservatives can have um, deleterious effects on the surface of the eye, but, you know, the vials, the vials are notoriously very difficult for many patients to use. You lose them, the cap falls, um, and, you know, there's, of course, the plastic (laughs) wastage. And so the different tier manufacturers have really listened to both doctors and patients. And now you can find what's called multi-dose preservative-free bottles. So it's actually a little eyedrop bottle, like you're traditionally used to seeing, but it has a one-way valve. And so that preservative-free tier stays preserved, but you don't have to use those little vials. The key is to look for the word preservative-free on the package. Do you have any brands that you particularly recommend when patients come in and ask you for artificial tears? Absolutely. I, I, the two, my two favorite artificial tears, both are preservative free and both in multi-dose bottles. So one is sustain complete that has um, a molecule in it that mimics the lipid component of tears. And then um, the other is Refresh Reliva Preservative Free, which also comes in that multi-dose bottle. Those are both excellent options. Um, The Refresh Reliva has hyaluronic acid, which is very lubricating. Um, And so, you know, when I guide patients, I always like to give them a list of tiers that I think are uh, good and safe to use. But I also recommend you trying them because not all of the tiers are equal. And if you're staying with that uh, preservative free, you know, it's going to be safe. There's something called punctal plugs, P-U-N-C-T-A-L. What are they? How well do they work? Uh, We've heard from people who say, well, that was a total waste of time. And other people who say, you know, that really helped. So punctal plugs are little silicone caps that your eye care provider can place into the puncta. That's the little opening kind of closer to your nose on the eyelid that drains tears away. And so, you know, I'm not surprised to hear that variable response because there's um, a time and a place for plugs. For patients who have a lot of inflammation on the surface of their eye, maybe they even also have coexisting seasonal allergies, plugs can be... um, absolutely the worst treatment for them. So you're trapping the tears onto the surface and kind of having the the drainage or the uh, tear evaporation happen more slowly. And so if those tears are left on the surface, but they're inflamed, or if allergens are hitting the surface and they're not flushed away, that can absolutely make someone potentially even feel worse than before the plugs. 
for patients that have more of a low tier volume, meaning like they put in preservative free tiers every two hours and they feel better, but they kind of wish that they didn't have to do something every two hours. Plugs can be very helpful for those patients because, you know, they have a more normal tier, but just reduced volume or reduced tier production. Uh, and so the plug will help to retain the tear on the surface of the eye. Dr. Gupta, I'm going to ask about a different type of um, over-the-counter, essentially, treatment it seems that there's a lot of confusion about it, and that is fish oil. Do omega-3 supplements help dry eyes? You know, I really do believe that they are helpful. Um, there's been a, a variety of reports in the literature. Um, there was a, a study not that long ago called the DREAM study in which they compared omega-3 fish oils to olive oil, and they didn't find a, a strong difference. Many of us argue that olive oil is actually a nutritional <laughs> source as well. And so um, there are other studies in the literature from, you know, before the dream study that show a strong benefit. And so I think as long as the patients don't have a contraindication or don't have any sort of, um, you know, aversion or uh, GI upset from taking the omega-3s, I encourage patients to do so. We know in the literature, just from the whole body. There's cardiovascular benefits, there's benefits in arthritis. And so it, with respect to the eyes, the way that omegas are helpful are that the oil substrates, the fats that are provided in omegas are, are more liquid. And so those fats then preferentially get used to make the oil in the meibomian glands, which are the oil that help to prevent evaporation of that tear film. So that's the mechanism. I encourage patients to try it and if they can tolerate it to continue, but certainly don't uh, force patients if they can't tolerate it or have side effects. And check with your primary care provider to make sure there are no interactions with other medications you're taking, like maybe anticoagulants. Uh, you've mentioned meibonium glands a couple of times, and, and I think people would like to know, well, where are they? Well, what are they? And what are they? In? <laughs> and, 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 I know they have the funniest name. Um, so there's about, you know, 20 to 25 of these glands that run vertically in the upper and lower eyelid. So their opening comes right, right close to where the eyelashes are. And so then they run vertical. These glands are just, you know, they're the teeniest structures, but they are so vital to having a healthy tear film. What fascinates me is we've been told that sometimes they get kind of plugged up, that, that the oil that they secrete sort of hardens and you have to kind of loosen it. And there's even a machine and we'll talk about Lipiflow in a minute, in a moment, but what about hot compresses? Is, is there some way to get those, glands to open up and secrete oil the way they used to when we were younger. Yeah. So the, the meibomian glands, as you mentioned, that, that oil should, I describe it to patients as it should be free flowing like olive oil in, in a normal, healthy eyelid. And over time with chronic inflammation and chronic obstruction of those glands, those oils go from being olive oil to maybe butter and then toothpaste, and then eventually the oil doesn't even come out. Hot compresses, so, you know, we're applying heat to the eyelid and trying to melt those secretions or make them more liquidy so that more of that oil comes into the tear film. One of the issues with hot compresses is that, you know, it's hard to get that sustained heat to the eyelid. Um, you know, they, the most devices, or even if you take a washcloth with hot water, you know, they don't stay uh, warm for very long, but also depending on how severe your disease is, warm compresses just might not be sufficient to adequately melt up those secretions. Well, in fact, a, a hot compress, a hot washcloth doesn't stay hot <laughs> very long. We have uh, seen devices that have something like uh, flaxseed or some other type of uh, little bead in that you, you heat it up in the microwave and, and that actually retains its heat for longer. Are those better? Yeah, I think those are certainly easier. There's actually even uh, newer devices that you can plug in and that have timers. Um, 
And so I think that you do need sustained heat. Of course, I tell all my patients, test it on the back of your hand so that, you know, it's kind of like a baby's bottle. You don't want to burn your eyes or your eyelids. Definitely not. So yes, but sustained heat is important. Um, The body's natural protective mechanism uh, is to have the blood vessels and the eyelid whisk away heat. And so, you know, it's, it's trying to avoid to have, you know, sustained heat uh, in that area. So uh, our protective mechanisms are kind of working against one of the therapeutics. Uh, So I like to suggest warm compresses for patients that maybe have more mild disease, or if they have severe disease to do it as something like a at-home maintenance after they have in-office treatment. Now, we mentioned Lipiflow. It is a very expensive in-office procedure. Uh, how well does it work? I mean, some people say it was expensive and it didn't work. It was a total waste of time. Other people seem to think it can be helpful. Give us some sense of this machine that actually heats the eyelids. Yeah. So, you know, Lipiflow was uh, FDA approved over uh, almost a decade ago. Um, and since then, there are uh, newer devices. There's the tear care system and ILUX. But, you know, all these devices are centered around being able to precisely place heat at the level of the meibomian glands and then are paired with some sort of system or process that expresses the oils from the glands. And so, it's not only heating that you need, but you need uh, to be able to express or get all of those plugged up secretions out so that the body can try to start producing new, um, more normal secretions. Uh, you're absolutely right. These procedures are not covered by insurance. The cost of these procedures has come down over the last decade. Uh, for patients that, you know, I like to stratify my patients as mild, moderate, severe, and that mybography image, the image of the meibomian glands that we talked about is really important to know because if patients have significant atrophy or loss of the meibomian glands, well, then you're working with a reduced amount of anatomy. And so that patient in particular with more severe disease might not have as much of a benefit in their symptoms as somebody with mild disease and very little atrophy. So it really depends on what stage you're in and what your anatomy looks like in terms of knowing where you're going to get, you know, symptom relief. You're listening to Dr. Priya Gupta, Managing Director of Triangle Eye Consultants in Raleigh, North Carolina. Dr. Gupta is an adjunct associate professor of ophthalmology at Tulane University School of Medicine. She serves as an elected member of the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, Refractive Surgery Clinical Committee. After the break, we're going to learn about something called pulsed light therapy for dry eyes. How do diet and lifestyle affect the eyes? Screen time tends to interfere with blinking. Are there ways to overcome that? There are drugs to treat dry eye. Which ones are most effective? And now there's a a new nasal spray for this condition. How do patients react when doctors suggest a nose spray to treat their dry eyes. Prescription medications can be pricey. Are there over-the-counter drugs that could help? You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. This podcast is made possible in part by Gaia Herbs. For more than 30 years, Gaia Herbs has nurtured the connection between people and plants to deliver nature's vitality. Their full-spectrum formulas are designed to provide an herb's complete array of beneficial compounds with nothing artificial to get in the way. Learn more at GaiaHerbs.com. That's G-A-I-A Herbs. Dot com. Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Cocovia, maker of high-potency cocoflavanol supplements that support cognitive and cardiovascular health. 
More information at cocovia.com. And by Gaia Herbs. Their formulas are designed to provide an herb's complete array of beneficial compounds with nothing artificial. More information at Gaia, G-A-I-A, herbs.com. You know that dry eye syndrome is common when drug companies devote hundreds of millions of dollars developing new treatments. Commercials on television are pricey, so they indicate there's a huge market for such medications. How well do they work? We're talking with Dr. Priya Gupta, Managing Director of Triangle Eye Consultants and an adjunct Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at Tulane University School of Medicine. She served previously as Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at Duke University Eye Center. Dr. Gupta, we have heard about and know nothing about pulsed light therapy for dry eyes. Can you tell us, is it something we should know about? And if so, what should we know? Absolutely. IPL or intense pulse light therapy, it has a history actually in dermatology. Um, It's traditionally used to treat uh, rosacea uh, facial uh, lesions. And so the way it works is it helps the, the broad spectrum light is concentrated in those fine blood vessels and the heat that's generated from the light actually shuts down those vessels. Um, that's important because those blood vessels of rosacea bring inflammation to the eyelid and lead to problems with the meibomian glands. So IPL is a treatment that's really kind of tailored for patients that have ocular rosacea or meibomian gland dysfunction as a critical component of their dry eye. Dr. Gupta, I believe that our listeners are especially interested in what we like to refer to as diet and lifestyle. So I'm talking about you know, what can we be eating? What should we be avoiding? Uh, should we have a humidifier going at night? Um, you know, how important is exercise? What about screen time, timeouts, breaks, vacations? Give us some some very practical, affordable approaches. Well, I think everyone should get a vacation, so... <laughs> <laughs> I think that, you know, that that's, it's it's such a tough question because um, everybody responds differently. So let's just take, you know, diet, for example. Um, I've had patients come in and say, you know, I started an anti-inflammatory diet or I started doing the whole 30 diet and my eyes feel better. And I absolutely, you know, I, I listen to all of my patients and I, I don't believe that I have all the right answers. And so for People that ask me about diet and nutrition, um, I think it's worth a a shot to look into an anti-inflammatory diet. Omega-3s can be a supplementation that can be helpful uh, to help with the meibomian glands. From a lifestyle perspective, I like to have my patients actually just observe what they're doing in daily life. Sometimes, you know, we're, we're not introspective enough. And so you know, I ask patients to try to figure out when your symptoms are worse. Is it when you're outside? Is it, you know, when first thing when you wake up in the morning? Um, we want to try to limit, you know, vents blowing towards the eyes, fans, computer time and screen time. You know, we're, we're notorious underraters of how long we use devices. And it's not just sitting in front of the computer, you know, your, your, your iPhone counts, your, uh, the time that you're reading a book counts. And so, having more of an accurate sense of where your symptoms are and what activities you're doing um, can be very helpful. I also, you know, think that environmental things like um, seasonal allergies and knowing, you know, if you have sensitivities to anything in your environment, even within your home, dust, um, mites, et cetera, uh, can be helpful information to help limit your exposure to those things. Humidifiers. I I love humidifiers. I think that humidifiers can just help to um, allow your eyes to have a little um, less of a challenge. And so for patients that maybe are on the computer for hours a day or work in older buildings where we know that maybe the humidity is not where it should be, just a tabletop humidifier right by your, um, you know, your computer at your desk or overnight on your nightstand while you're sleeping can be very helpful. And then last but not certainly not least, you know, lifestyle modification. So wear sunglasses when you're outside so the wind and the allergens don't hit your eyes. 
if you're on the computer for a while, taking a break, the 20-20-20 rule is every 20 minutes, try to look away 20 feet. And, um, you know, I, th- I think that some of these things seem so easy. <laughs> Um, they're not complicated, but it requires a little bit of introspection and a little bit of dedication to modifying some of those factors. Now, are any of these good for preventing dry eye? I think the nutritional aspects can help to prevent dry eye, but, um, really it depends on your risk factors and which risk factors are modifiable. Dr. Gupta. I like to talk about pharmaceuticals as a pharmacologist, and there are some drugs that have come on market over the last decade or two. We've seen commercials on television for a drug called Restasis. Uh, It's cyclosporin. It's a drug that is used for preventing organ rejection. Uh, Cyclosporin is an anti, it kind of affects the immune system. It seems like an odd drug for dry eyes. Tell us about that and some of the other newer drugs that have come on board and how they might work. Absolutely. Uh, Restasis was FDA approved well over a decade ago. So we have a lot of clinical experience and you're absolutely right. In in high doses, it's used as an anti-rejection drug. But on the eye, it is a 0.05% solution and it's an eye drop that is used twice a day. And the way it works for the eye is it helps to block the activation of T cells. T cells are our body cells that help uh, help to recruit and create inflammation. And so it's a medication that is a long term medication. It's not used for you know just a, a couple weeks. Um, it's one drop twice a day. Um, from there, you know the the next sort of generation of drug is a uh, Zydra or Lafitagrast. And that is, um, you better about... spell Z- Zydra because it's a little <laughs> yeah. challenging. Absolutely. It's X I I D R A. So that, that molecule is uh, working on a different pathway. Um, it blocks the activation and the recruitment of T cells. Uh, so similar concept though, it's a, one drop twice a day molecule uh, aimed at improving the inflammation. And remember, if we improve inflammation on the surface, then that can help the the surface of the eye to repair itself um, for the corneal epithelial cells to regenerate um, and then reduce symptoms. Newer to the market is actually uh, a nasal spray to treat dry eye disease. Um, this is a uh, Tirvaya or uh, Varenicline solution. The trigeminal nerve is really important in terms of stimulating tear production. And so this is a nasal spray. It's sprayed in one spray in each nostril twice a day. And the molecule actually stimulates that trigeminal nerve to create a complete tear. So it stimulates the lacrimal gland to produce the water layer. It stimulates the meibomian glands in the eyelid to release a little of that oil. And it stimulates the goblet cells on the surface to release a little mucin. So interestingly, once you know you spray it in the nostril, within a minute or two, you can actually feel that tear production. Um, that, so it's, it's really a novel uh, pathway, something that's different than some of our traditional treatments. I'm wondering if you have any trouble convincing uh, your patients that a nose spray is going to be useful for their dry eyes. And I'm also wondering if insurance covers it. It's pretty pricey, isn't it? Well, so I had the same thought as you of like, oh, great, no one's going to want to use a nasal spray. And it turns out that patients who suffer from dry eye disease really don't like putting things in their eyes. Their surface is very sensitive. And so many of them are happy to not have to put um, some of the traditional medications like Restasis and Zydra can burn when it goes in. And so this nasal spray actually stimulates tears without the patient having to put anything on the surface. So patients have been surprisingly accepting of it. The one side effect that, you know, maybe is a little different, of course, as eye doctors, we're not used to nasal sprays, but many patients do report um, sneezing after instilling the spray or maybe a cough. Sure. And so I do like to warn patients about that, but most of those are mild and not severe. And then regarding coverage, the the product was just FDA approved at the end of last year. And so for patients with commercial insurance, it's very accessible. Um, I have patients that are paying as little as $10 a month for it. 
But unfortunately for my patients with Medicare, this, this, because it's such a new medication, um, it hasn't gone onto the formulary list for uh, the Medicare population. And so hopefully in the year to come, um, they'll make some headway on that because certainly many of my Medicare aged population would benefit from this uh, treatment. Now we talked about side effects for Tirvaya. And it causes sneezing because it's a nasal spray. But we didn't talk so much about side effects of the other medications, the cyclosporin, the uh, lifidogress. What kinds of side effects do these anti-inflammatory drugs have? Well, the good news is that because it's an eye drop with either of those two molecules, um, there really is, it's extremely low risk from a systemic standpoint, meaning that the amount that's actually potentially absorbed in the bloodstream is uh, quite minimal. I believe it's one twenty fifth of 1%. So um, we don't have to worry so much about uh, systemic side effects. Um, in terms of the eyes, I would say for lifidogras, um, the three most common side effects are temporary burning, blurred vision, which is usually about 10 10 minutes or less, and then a funny taste. And don't ask me why that medicine causes a funny taste, but those are the three common ones for that. And then for restasis, I would say the most common thing I hear from patients is um, a potential burning up, upon installation. So, you know, every patient's a little bit different. Not everybody experiences a side effect, but I think it's important to counsel and, and let patients know what they might experience. One other thing that we have uh, heard of, and it's probably pretty controversial, is low-dose naltrexone. What are your thoughts on that? In my practice, the low-dose naltrexone is really used for patients that have um, what we call neuropathic pain. There's some sort of abnormal neural connection um, from the eyes to the brain, typically, you know, branches of the trigeminal nerve in which the body is perceiving, you know, pain at a heightened level instead of a normal level. And so low dose naltrexone can be helpful for those patients um, that they often might get mistaken as dry eye disease, actually. Um, You know, they, they see multiple doctors and classically, these are patients that have significant symptoms but have very little objective findings on the eye. Like we don't see breakdown of the cornea. We don't see an abnormal tear breakup time. And so it it can be a life-changing medication. It typically has to be compounded um, at a pharmacy. And um, again, more for the neuropathic pain patient. And we should explain that naltrexone is a drug that is an opioid antagonist. Um, It's being used off-label for a number of autoimmune conditions. It's an interesting drug, but it's somewhat controversial. I do want to know about relative cost. If somebody had to pay out of pocket for Restasis or Trevia or Exidra, I mean, how much would they cost, roughly speaking? Great question. Uh, traditionally, these are these can be very expensive medications. There's, you know, some as, even with insurance. If there's, you know, some insurances don't cover these medications, it can be hundreds of dollars per month. And certainly, patients are savvy and, and can figure out how to extend the life of the vials to stretch the the medication uh, in the vial. But absolutely, I think without insurance coverage, and even sometimes with insurance coverage, they really can be. Um, quite expensive. And and this is not something that patients are using, you know, for a short period. It's often um, many years. Let's go back to what the symptoms of dry eyes are. If someone is just, you know, not completely sure that this is really their problem, how would, how would they know? Who should they seek out? Is it their optometrist? Is it an ophthalmologist? Is there a specialist who focuses primarily on dry eyes? So please summarize the symptoms and who to specialize in, who who to go to for help if this is a really serious problem. Well, the classic symptoms of dry eyes are irritation, redness, and fluctuating vision. Those are the three most common symptoms that I see. Um, there can be other symptoms like 
itching and, you know, redness that's, that's variable that are also kind of red flags. And really, you know, I, I would go to an eye care, a general eye care provider first, you know, if you get an annual eye exam, um, that provider I think is a good first place to start. There are different, you know, levels of providers in the sense that, you know, there are specialists in dry eye disease. I think that um, a general uh, optometrist or a general ophthalmologist is a great starting point. Um, they can often put you on some of the initial therapies and, and, and really first, you know, do a good evaluation to make sure it is dry eye disease um, that you're experiencing. And then from there, you know, the next sort of level is to see someone that specializes in dry eye disease. Um, those are going to be doctors that maybe have access to advanced therapies in office treatments, et cetera. And remind us what not to buy over the counter and what your two favorite brands are. Avoid preservatives um, and and redness relievers. Those are two uh, molecules that really can have some negative uh, effects on the eye when they're used for uh, longer periods of time. My favorite products are preservative free tears, and um, the favorite brands are Sustain Complete and Refresh Reliva Preservative Free. Dr. Priya Gupta, thank you ever so much for talking with us on the People's Pharmacy today. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Dr. Priya Gupta, who's Managing Director of Triangle Eye Consultants and an Adjunct Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at Tulane University School of Medicine. Until 2021, she was Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at Duke University Eye Center. She specializes in cataract, cornea, and refractive surgery and is an international expert in the area of dry eye disease. Lynn Siegel produced today's show. Al Wodarski engineered. Dave Graydon edits our interviews. B.J. Lederman composed our theme music. This show is a co-production of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC, with The People's Pharmacy. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Cocovia, maker of high-potency cocoflavanol supplements that support cognitive and cardiovascular health. More information at cocovia.com. And by Gaia Herbs. Their formulas are designed to provide an herb's complete array of beneficial compounds with nothing artificial. More information at GaiaHerbs.com. Today's show is number 1309. You can find it online at peoplespharmacy.com. That's where you can post your comments to let us know what you think about today's interview. Also in that post, we have a link to a list of anticholinergic drugs. We surely would like to learn about your experience with dry eyes. What have you found helpful? You can email us, radio at peoplespharmacy.com, or share your story in the comments section of the show notes on the website. The email address again is radio at peoplespharmacy.com. The podcast for this show is available through your favorite podcast provider. We post the show on our website on Monday morning. At peoplespharmacy.com, you can sign up for our free online newsletter to get the latest news about important health stories. By subscribing to our newsletter, you'll also have regular access to our weekly podcast and find out ahead of time which topics we'll be covering. In Durham, North Carolina, I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next week. Thank you for listening to the People's Pharmacy Podcast. It's an honor and a pleasure to bring you our award-winning program week in and week out. But producing and distributing this show as a free podcast takes time and costs money. If you like what we do and you'd like to help us continue to produce high-quality, independent healthcare journalism, please consider chipping in. All you have to do is go to peoplespharmacy.com slash donate. Whether it's just one time or a monthly donation, you can be part of the team that makes this show possible. Thank you for your continued loyalty and support. We couldn't make our show without you.